Welcome to Perceptions Today podcast. We will be discussing a wide variety of changing perceptions and ongoing research about topics such as consciousness, health, medicine, science, physics, history, metaphysics, the paranormal and reality. Join us as we learn and discover fascinating new information about these and other topics from people in the field, doing the research and having the experiences. During our discussions, we hope to engage you in the process to ignite your own creativity and alter your perceptions in new and exciting ways. The adventure begins now. Find us on podcast apps, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Once again, that's Perceptions Today. Upcoming event, the author and researcher Anthony Peake will be joining us for five hours in two question and answer sessions on Twitter space. UK date, 15th of December 2021, starting at 9am to 11am, then from 3pm to 5pm. The following people are involved in the Perceptions Today community in a variety of ways. Two examples are as guests on Twitter spaces, which are live audio events, and on this podcast. When you hear guests that you like, subscribe to their social media, along with letting them know you came from the Perceptions Today community. Hi, I'm Warren Booth, writer and researcher of ancient mythologies, consciousness, and the science of psychedelics. My books include The Spirit in the Sky, Ancient Cosmological Gods, and Where in the World We Find Them, and DMT, Deities, Myth, and Tryptamines. But what, you might ask, are they about? Well, there appears to be a so-called global awakening, but what does this really mean? After all, here we are in the 21st century seeking answers to questions such as who are we? How do we get here? Why are we here? Where, or indeed, what is here? And of course, what's next? We find ourselves somewhat blindly poking around in outer space in search of some of these answers, with almost zero knowledge of the inner realms of our own metaphysical and spiritual existence. We confidently, if not arrogantly, assume ourselves the very apex of sophisticated and technological evolution. But what if we're not the greatest after all? Albert Einstein once famously quipped that the ancients knew something which we seem to have forgotten. I contend that a Graham Hancock-esque pre-Diluvian lost civilization may have essentially hidden some of these answers for us in plain sight. That they've inserted a scientifically viable methodology into the very fabric of their mythologies and chiseled them into stone for the benefit of future generations of the human narrative. By way of pre-Diluvian, I mean pre-flood. And we're all familiar with the tales of the global flood myths, which now appear, excuse the pun, to hold a lot of water. We also understand and accept that global sea levels rose exponentially at the end of the last mini ice age, 11,500 years or so ago. It's a scientific anomaly which rather curiously reflects Plato's tale of a sophisticated society otherwise lost to the current chronology of human civilization. So could Plato have been right all along? You bet. Classical historians relied upon the lack of evidence of said lost society's existence, but the times they are are changing. Enter Gebekli Tepe. Gebekli Tepe is a cosmologically aligned temple construction which is dedicated. Enter Gebekli Tepe. Gebekli Tepe is a cosmologically aligned temple construction which is dated to around 8000 BC. It appears to symbolically suggest that the end of the last ice age or younger driest period was due in part to a celestial bombardment of the North American ice cap. Modern day geological evidence suggests that the 13 mile wide diameter Hiawatha crater in Greenland somewhat pinpoints the impact zone described by the high relief pillar carvings found at Gebekli Tepe. The site still only remains 5% excavated, and Gebekli Tepe in modern day Turkey means pot bellied hill, but it also has a far more archaic name, Port Asar, which translates as the umbilical of Osiris, which links directly to my research hypothesis, which I write about in The Spirit in the Sky, and my latest book, DMT, Deities, Myth and Tryptamine. Ancient Egyptian mythology reveals a rather profound insight into the curious riddle that is human consciousness, and it's also the earliest reference to the mythological tree of life. The tale of Osiris, god of resurrection, begins during an elaborate banquet where the guests had all been invited by Seth, who was Osiris's wicked brother, to each lay down inside a beautifully ornate coffer and suggested whoever befitted it comfortably could indeed keep it. Guest after guest tried the magnificent coffer, each struggling with its dimensions, either coming up a little short or far too tall, until the turn of Osiris. Osiris duly laid down inside to find it fit him perfectly. Yet to the guest's thunder amazement, 
Seth and his men seize the opportunity and swiftly fasten the coffer with Osiris inside before tossing it into the River Nile. Coffer eventually ran ashore upon the coastal banks of Byblos in modern-day Lebanon, where Osiris became further in tune within the trunk of a resplendent tamarisk tree. After a number of years, the king of Byblos ordered the felling of the tree, as it was to be carved into a wonderful pillar which was going to adorn the halls of his palace. After years of searching, Osiris' sister and wife, Isis, learned of her lover's fate and bargained with the king who duly agreed to release Osiris from his untimely grave. Seth was enraged by this and dismembered Osiris, thus dispatching of his brother once and for all. Legend further dictates that Osiris then became symbolically associated with the constellation of Orion, a celestial god of resurrection. Classically speaking, Egyptologists remain steadfast that this was in fact the case. Osiris was murdered, rescued from inside a tree, before coming symbolic of the constellation of Orion, which is an absurdity in the extreme. So if we're not in full agreement with the Egyptologists, could it be possible that it means something else entirely? Something wholly allegorical, maybe? The myth of Osiris verifies that because Osiris was entombed within the confines of a tamarisk, which is an acacia variety found in abundance on the banks of the River Nile, that he would always be remembered as the so-called lifeblood of the acacia. And it's here where it really starts to become interesting. Within, within the sap or lifeblood of the acacia, we find extractable potentials of DMT an entheogenic chemical compound which permeates the natural world and is also found inside the human body. Basic two-dimensional rendering of this molecular structure of this otherworldly psychedelic compound shares an inexplicable number of commonalities with the constellation of Orion, Osiris in the Sky. In my first book, The Spirit in the Sky, I introduced the reader to the shared cosmology of both Osiris and Jesus. And paradolia aside, I described the crucified Christ alongside the human brainstem, whereby the location of Jesus' head is in direct correlation with the pineal gland. DMT, we find, is also in the pineal gland. Furthermore, I postulate that Jesus' crown of thorns may in fact be symbolic of the acacia itself, and of course, the DMT found therein. There are many examples of this Osiris and Jesus allegory, which we should really be aware of. For starters, the Bible is basically an allegorical anthology. It even states as such on many occasions, with references such as for it's explicitly clear when revealing the words of God. It is out of Egypt I have called my son. Understand the proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Jesus did not tell them anything without using a parable. And lastly, I will utter dark sayings of old. This last statement being another clue to the antiquity of which we are discussing. How old? Older than the pyramids, maybe. Almost certainly. Jesus, we are told, is the Son of God, and the Bible is extremely specific when recalling the notion that God is light. The Bible also describes Jesus as the Amen, and the Amen is synonymous with Amun. Amun Ra is the ancient Egyptian solar deity, or God of Light, who is symbolic of the pyramid. Now, the Great Pyramid's longitudinal location and base construction dimensions appear to dictate the speed of light and are a hemispheric model of the Earth to a ratio of 43,200 to 1. This number at first glance may appear somewhat arbitrary, but there are in fact 43,200 seconds of daylight during the equinox, a total of 86,400 seconds in a solar day, which rather bizarrely correlates alongside the diameter of the Sun itself, some 864,000 miles across. The Great Pyramid is encoded with a plethora of measurements which are fundamental to mathematics, our understanding of our place and time in space and the cosmos. But we also understand that its angles of incline are the same as those required to perceive a rainbow. And it's here where the etymology of Osiris becomes extremely revealing. OS carries a number of otherwise hidden meanings, the most revealing being God and open. Iris, however, is ancient Greek for the word rainbow, and it's also associated with the human eye. Furthermore, Osiris's physical attributes also share a great deal in common with the photoreceptors within the human eye and the pineal gland. The pineal gland, we find, is the light receptor of the body, and rather astonishingly, it's connected to the optic thalamus, which almost completely renders it a third eye. And the allegorical nature of the Bible makes more sense now, should we envisage what it's being described when Jesus says, When thine eye be single, thy body shall be filled with light. In fact, it's in Genesis where Jacob says he came face to face with God and he called the place Peniel. The pineal gland scientific name 
is Epiphysis Cerebri, the root of which we find the word Epiphany, meaning a moment of divine inspiration from within the midst of one's mind's eye. And just like an eye, it also contains rods and cones. Cones of which are shaped like the headdress of Osiris are responsible converting photons of light into minute electrical stimuli from which the brain renders our three-dimensional exterior reality. And like Osiris, the chief photoreceptor is green in colour. And as if to reinforce the hypothesis further, Osiris' son Horus is considered a falcon deity, falcons being known for their extraordinary vision. As we understand it, human vision accounts for a minuscule 0.0035% of the electromagnetic spectrum, the remaining 99% or so entirely invisible to our everyday ocular capacity. Terence McKenna once described DMT as a reality switch, whereby the practitioner, breakthrough psychonaut, would somewhat become privy to an otherwise invisible mindscape. Terence McKenna once described DMT as a reality switch whereby the practitioner, or breakthrough psychonaut, would become somewhat privy to an otherwise invisible mindscape which exists around us but deemed unobservable within the scope of visual spectrum. Could this otherworldly experience then be likened to the ancient Egyptian duet, or underworld, which was resided by Osiris, where they describe inhabited beings and gods and entities? The commonalities are there for all to see. The Egyptian Book of the Dead and the ancient Egyptian Book of Two Ways describes the soul's journey through a number of otherworldly gateways which are classically guarded by spirits and entities which appear to hold a lot in common with the so-called DMT breakthrough experience. The DMT experience is often spoke of in terms of ego dissolution, whereby the practitioner classically be subjected to a mini-death. For all intended purposes, this whistle-stop tour of the cosmos sees us becoming gods, being given the keys to understanding the nature of our own temporal existence, all before realising a reality-shattering and spiritual resurrection, just like Jesus and Osiris before him. So, could there be more to the myths than meets the eye? I believe so. I also like to believe that the Perceptions Today Twitter community is a growing clique of curious like-minded accounts who appear to be seeking the same answers to some of life's biggest questions. A fun and friendly environment where new insights are regularly found in scientific arenas in which sometimes science itself appears to be a little lost. Once again, I'm RN Voot, Twitter handle, at Voot RN, spelled V-O-O-G-H-T-R-N. All other multimedia outlets such as Facebook, Instagram and YouTube can easily be found via the same handle. I look forward to welcoming you and thank Paul of Perceptions for promoting my research. Sincere and spirited wishes always. RN.